Welcome to the fourth and final talk in our series on Julian of Norwich, which is called Visions of Salvation. We have come at last to those immortal words that are known and loved by many. And no Julian talk would be complete if we didn't have them. All shall be well. All shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. But what does Julian really mean by them? To answer that question, we have to return to the text and to chapter 27 of her Revelations of Divine Love, where they first appear in the 13th Revelation. After this, the Lord brought to mind the longing that I had for him before, and I saw that nothing held me back except sin, and I saw that this is so with all of us in general. And it seemed to me that if there had been no sin, we should all have been pure and like our Lord as he made us. And so in my folly, I had often wondered before this time why, through the great foreseeing wisdom of God, the beginning of sin was not prevented. For then, it seemed to me, all would have been well. I should have given up such thoughts, yet I grieved and sorrowed over this unreasonably and without discretion. But Jesus, who in this vision informed me of everything needful to me, answered with these words and said, Sin is befitting, but all shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. In this unadorned word sin, our Lord brought to mind everything in general which is not good, and the shameful scorn and the uttermost abnegation that he bore for us in his life, and his dying, and all the pains and sufferings in body and spirit of all his creatures. For we are all in part set at naught, and we shall be set at naught following the example of our Lord Jesus until we are fully purged. That is to say, until our mortal flesh is made as nothing and all our inward feelings which are not true. And in contemplating this, together with all the sufferings that ever were or ever shall be, I understand Christ's passion as the greatest and most surpassing suffering and all this was shown in, a, in an instant and quickly turned into consolation. For our good Lord did not wish the soul to be frightened by this ugly sight. But I did not see sin, for I believe it has no kind of substance nor share of being, nor could it be recognised except by the suffering it causes. And as it seems to me this suffering is something that exists for a while, because it purges us and makes us know ourselves and ask for mercy. For the passion of our Lord is a comfort to us against all this, and that is his blessed will. And because of the tender love which our good Lord has for all who shall be saved, he comforts us readily and sweetly, meaning this, it is true that sin is cause of all this suffering. But all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. These words were said very tenderly, indicating no kind of blame for me or for anyone who will be saved. So it would be most unkind to blame God or marvel at him because of my sin, since he does not blame me for sin. And in these same words I saw a marvellous and exalted mystery hidden in God, a mystery which he will make openly known to us in heaven, in which knowledge we shall truly see the reason why he allowed sin to come about. And in the sight of this we shall rejoice in our Lord God for ever. We have left the world of visionary encounter far behind and returned to earth with a bump. 
How different is the language, tone and structure of this chapter to the last ecstatic, speech-defying moment which closed the former? It is as if we have been on the heights of Mount Sinai or Mount Tabor. The cloud of unknowing has parted as mist in the morning and we have seen Christ transfigured in light and love. But only for a moment. Her words, unable to express what she had seen, lie crumbled before her in a heap of sodden syllables to be left in silence. Only at the end has she thrown out a lifeline to us and said that we will receive her cord of broken words as far as God gives us grace in understanding and loving. But with the conditionality of this statement, the mist descends once more and the moment has gone as Julian is reminded of all that prevents us from knowing that Christ is the fullness of our joy, homely and courteous, full of bliss and our true life. The 27th chapter opens with a small ray of light. The Lord reminds Julian of the longing that she had before. Right at the beginning of her text, before the sickness and the nighttime sufferings, before her revelations and the days, weeks, months and years of meditating upon them, before even the enclosure in the anchor hold, Julian tells us of three childhood wishes which were common desires amongst the 14th century devout. The first was to relive the passion in her imagination. The second, to receive a bodily sickness, to be purged by the mercy of God and live a more noble, honourable life. And the third was that she may receive three wounds. The wound of contrition, the wound of kind compassion, and the wound of purposeful longing. She tells us that she forgot about the first two desires, but that this third with its three wounds continually stayed with her. When all is lost and hidden, Julian is reminded of her first love, her childhood desire to have the wound of longing. It cannot but be noticed that just as Christ has shown his wounds to her in the 10th revelation and invited Julian to climb into them to hide and find her peace, so she is reminded now of her own reciprocal wound of love longing, reflecting back to Christ his longing for us. However, as you will know from your own spiritual moments and highs, they invariably also make us more aware of what mars and prevents our ability to be close to God. And it's summed up in that little word, sin. Julian doesn't really go into explaining what sin is. At this point, the word is obvious for her and the 14th century reader, but perhaps not so obvious for us today. During the 14th century, there was a very clear system of confession and penance, where the penitent had schemes to follow to ensure that their confession was full and true. One of the most significant and influential of these schemes was set up by Robert Grosstes, the Bishop of Lincoln in the 13th century. His Templum Dei, believed to have been written to supplement his constitutions for the Diocese of Lincoln between 1239 and 46, combined two important elements which gave clarity and purpose to this interior examination. Firstly, a clear 
systematic approach, which meant that complex sins and their species could be understood and remembered. And secondly, setting the confessional work of the priest within a larger scheme of salvation. In both Templum Dei and Deus Est, the latter a penitential tract attributed to Grosteste, the seven deadly sins are treated in relation to love. In Deus Est, it is in the nature of man to love God with all his soul, all his heart and all his mind. For man consists of a soul with three parts, vegetative, sensible and rational, and a body made up of four elemental properties or cardinal virtues. Through the powers of the soul, man then is able to love God by practicing the virtues of humility, exaltation, patience, generosity, spiritual activity, abstinence and continence. However, this nature has been distorted, which leads to excess and failure in virtue, namely vice or sin. For gross test, confession is seen as dealing with this failure to practice the virtues, thereby enabling the soul once again to love God as it was meant to. Templum Dei concludes with a description of the threefold life of love, namely meditation on God, works of mercy and knowledge of one's own wretchedness and dignity. There was plenty of opportunity to consider and gain knowledge of one's own wretchedness. It was preached daily from the pulpit set out in devotional texts like the Ancre Navisa, dealt with in by spiritual directors like Richard Roll and Walter Hilton, depicted in plays and visualised on walls. Few so-called mystical or devotional texts even did not have sections which gave advice on how to handle sin. We might skate over them to get to the better bits but they are there, even in Julian. Perhaps the clearest way to express how Julian saw sin and explain what she means by the words, nothing prevented me but sin, is to turn to chapter 51, where we find an extended example of a Lord and a servant that was given to her, in addition to her revelations, to answer the question of how does God see sin? Here she describes the fall in terms which resonate with Anselm's theory of atonement. But what is significant for us is what happens to the beloved servant when he rushes off to do the Lord's bidding. In his haste to fulfill his Lord's desire, the servant trips and falls into a slade, as Julian calls it, which means for us probably a valley or a ditch or a mire, and gets badly hurt. So wounded, in fact, that he moans and groans and wallows and writhes in the ditch, unable to get up and is unable to look up and see the face of his loving Lord which was very near and full of comfort. Instead, as a completely enfeebled person, he unwisely can only focus on the pain and the suffering that he has to bear. And so the servant is cut off from the Lord, unaware of his loving countenance as he's trapped in the mire which is sin. It's a wonderfully graphic image which beautifully encapsulates not what sin is, but what it feels like, how one experiences it. As Paul honestly says to the fledgling church in Rome, 
for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. For Julian, this sin of the miry word of sarks causes blindness and folly and prevents us from seeing our Lord as our fullness of joy and of life. You can feel the frustration in Julian's words as she turns into what can only be called argumentative mode and fires that accusation at God which many still voice today. Why didn't you stop sin from happening? If you had, we would have been all right and just like you created us. It's your fault and you could have prevented it. Then everything would have been all right. Of course, Julian doesn't quite say it like that. But behind her gracious, wondering words, this is exactly what she means. Julian makes a lovely aside, which discloses Julian the person fighting with her own failings, just like Paul. I should have given up these thoughts, she said. Yet I grieved and sorrowed over this, unreasonable and without discretion. But it's from this passionate outburst that the 13th vision now unfolds. Once again, Jesus speaks to her as he has done throughout these four showings and picks up those final five words, all should have been well, and projects them into the future so that she may know everything is needful to her at this time. But first of all, he has to sort out sin and show how Julian is to regard it in the full scheme of salvation. Jesus therefore says to Julian, first of all, that sin is behoverly. The word behoverly is an interesting Middle English term which cannot be easily translated into modern English. It generally means that something is befitting or appropriate, but it does not usually appear in these adjectival terms. It may well be that what lies behind this use of the word is the theological doctrine of the happy fault, which we find being expressed in the heart of the great exultant Easter hymn that is sung at the end of the Easter Vigil to mark the climax of the liturgical celebrations that begin Easter. Here the cantor sings, O certe necessarum ade peccatum, quod Christi morte delatum est, O Felix culpa, quae tellum actantum meriti habere redemptitorum. Or in English, O truly necessary sin of Adam, destroyed completely by the death of Christ. O happy fault that earned for us so great, so glorious a Redeemer. If we go to the other end of the liturgical year, you will probably recognise it making an appearance in the Christmas carol that often follows the reading of the fall in the ceremony of the nine lessons and carols. Adam lay a bounden, bounden in a bond, four thousand winters, thought he not too long, and all was for an apple, an apple that he took, as Clark has find and written in their book. Nay had the apple tacken bin, the apple tacken bin, nay had never a lady a bin a queb heavenly quin. Blessed be the tim that apple taken was, therefore we bound singin 
Deo gratias, Deo gratias. Both of these liturgical moments of the past and the present still hold that medieval notion that in some way the fall was a happy fault or necessarium in the scheme of salvation. Dennis Turner has brought in another associative word to Behovli, which is the Latin conveniens, from which we get the English word convenient. To the great medieval theologians like Anselm, Hugh of Victor, Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure, it had a slightly different sense from convenient, but meant more like it is fitting or it is just so. In this sense, sin is therefore seen as a convenience or fits within the grand scheme of things, namely the grand scheme of salvation. For the early 14th century Franciscan theologian Don Scotus, this grand scheme, however, needed to be viewed backwards if it was to be fully understood. Instead of placing the fall as the progenitor of God's need to act, Scotus agreed that God had eternally willed the Son to be the head of a glorified creation. From this eschatological viewpoint, the fall then is seen as but a necessary part of God's will for his creation, which enabled the incarnation and then the passion of Christ, not only to deal with sin, but also to glorify humanity through Christ. Julian's text resonates more widely with this medieval idea, not only of the happy fault, but also that Christ's incarnation was part of God's wider plan. This can be seen if we return to chapter 51 and our poor servant who is groaning and moaning in the ditch, unable to see the loving countenance of the Lord. As Julian explores the meaning and symbolism of this example, she soon comes to realise that whilst the servant is Adam, every man, because of his unity with humanity, Christ is actually the servant who falls into the clay of this human life of flesh. The pains he experiences, whilst they are the pains of sin, are in fact the suffering on the cross for all that sin is and takes upon himself all the blame which it incurs and produces. The example ends with the servant standing before the throne of God wearing a crown of riches on his head. For as she writes, we are his crown, the father's joy the Son's worship, the Holy Ghost's liking, and endless, marvellous bliss to all that be in heaven. This is the same revelation of truth that we saw in the Twelfth Vision. But the example shows that while this is the truth of what Christ is and who we are, in this life we will still experience sorrow and woe of the mire. But this is overpassing for the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. Hence, Jesus' words state that sin is behovely, but all shall be well. We only find these words in the long text. The short text probably, not surprisingly, stops at sin is behovely and then carries on to explain what sin is. The words which precede this seem to imply that it's not for Julian to delve into matters that are too mysterious for her. Jesus has given her all she needs to know through the teachings of Holy Church. So she writes in the short text, 
for our Lord with the showing of this has left me to Holy Church and I am hungry and thirsty and needy and sinful and freely and willfully submits me to the teaching of Holy Church with all mine even Christian into the end of my life. This statement has been written off by some scholars as simply trying to keep the right side of the authorities and she's saying what others would want to hear. But it seems to me that Julie wants her revelations to deepen and explain the teachings of Holy Church, not just to do lip service to the body of Christ here on earth. So she comes back to this statement in her long text and erases it in order to conflate the two sayings of Jesus, sin is behovely and all shall be well with that little word, but. Sin may have a place in the scheme of salvation. It may be necessary to purge us and make us know ourselves for what we are and ask for mercy, but all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. This is the first time that these words appear in Julian's text. They have their roots back in chapter 5, which we seem to have constantly been returning to in these four talks, and also in chapter 11. And for those Julian lovers, I could not mention the hazelnut. Of course, for all of you who know your Julian text, she doesn't actually mention holding a hazelnut in her palm, but rather that God shows her all that is made and it appears to her as round and as small as the size of a hazelnut. I really love Nicholas Meinheer's rendition of this in the painting that we have used throughout these talks because he takes us away from the erroneous hazelnut to focus on what she was really trying to say. The God showed her the whole world, the whole universe, and it was so small that she thought it would suddenly vanish because of its littleness, or as she says, come to nothing. But God reassures her and says that it only lasts and ever shall because God loves it. We then hear the words which are a precursor to the all shall be well statement and that is, and so all thing hath their being by the love of God. While chapter 5 reveals that God sustains all the third revelation in chapter 11 shows that God is in all things and does all things. In this revelation, Julian sees God in a point. Again, it is the question of sin which comes to Julian's mind as a result of this showing. But what Julian's vision of God, but what makes Julian's vision of God is that the world and reality is wider and larger than Julian can see. God is present in all things. He sustains all things. He does all things. It is this sense of his omnipresence and omnipotence that comes together in the reassuring statement that we find in chapter 27. We may not understand now how or why sin fits within the grand scheme of salvation, but God does and he assures us, makes an obligation to us that all shall be well. For the next 12 chapters, Julian will explore what this could mean with the words 
all shall be well, appearing six times in different forms. And then again in chapter 63 and finally in chapter 85, until word, Christ's words then truly become her words. She writes, and then shall none of us be stirred to say in anything, Lord, if it had been thus, it had been well. But we shall all say with one voice, Lord, blessed must this be, for it is thus, it is well. And now we see truly that all things are done as it was thine ordinance before anything was made. Julian here is referring to what was revealed to her at the end of her 13th revelation and keeps coming back again and again and again. That there is a marvellous and exalted mystery hidden in God which he will make known to us in heaven. Now we suffer with Christ on his cross, bearing the pains of sin. Our sight is blinded and we are wounded. We cannot see with God's eyes or from his perspective of salvation. But if these four visions have shown us anything, it is that we need not worry about this or about anything. For the eternal joy and presence of our Lord is still there, even if it is beyond our reality. Julian's visions have given us a glimpse of hope, visions of salvation, to reassure us in the midst of our suffering and our pain that Christ's words are true, and indeed sin may have its place but that the Trinity does and will indeed make all manner of things well.